Now, it's my great honour to have Alistair Cook, or our great honour to have Alistair Cook as our next speaker. Cook is one of those, Cook is one of those um, commentators you drop everything to listen to because he has a lot to say about why we're in the mess we're in, who's responsible, how it is to be fixed with great wisdom and signature eloquence. Alistair Crook is Director of Conflicts Forum, a geopolitical and geofinancial consultancy. He was formerly advisor on Middle East issues to Javier Solana, the EU foreign policy chief. He was also a staff member of Senator George Mitchell's fact-finding committee that inquired into the causes of the Intifada of 2000 and 2001 and an advisor to the International Quartet. He initiated a number of ceasefires in the occupied territories on behalf of the European Union and has 35 years' experience of working with Islamist movements. He's the author of Resistance, the Essence of the Islamist Revolution and is a regular media commentator on politics and geofinancial issues. The title of his address today is Soon We Become a People Without a Memory of the Past. Alistair Crook, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, greetings here from just outside Rome, where it's a rather grey, rainy day. Um, and I'm sure it's a lot better where you are. Um, I wanted to start off by talking about the famous French philosopher, Henri Cobain. Uh, Henri Cobain um, was, um, he placed himself in Iran. He is the foremost scholar uh, of Shi'i philosophy and thinking. And he was, he taught at Tehran University for many years. And he tells us a story. He tells us a story about how he was in a restaurant one day with a Western friend. And in the restaurant, there was this old cupboard. And it had these shelves on it. And there was a sort of panel that ran along the top of the shelf. And into that panel was cut the shapes of vases, pottery, and other things that fitted into their, into their slot on the shelf um, above the, the main cover. And of course, there was nothing there. These were long gone vases, pieces of pottery in this old cupboard. And all that remained was a sort of cut out profile into which the vases and the shapes were expected to be fit. Um, they were broken or gone. Nevertheless, what Corbin said to his friend was that the space that these entities, the, these vases, these domestic um, utensils had occupied still somehow existed in time and space. The outlines are clear, but the, the space they occupied um, was still somehow tangible and real. And the point that he was trying to, to make here um, was that somehow, even though things have gone, even though things have been suppressed, ideas have been suppressed, even though language has been cancelled or removed or is not allowed, ideas are not allowed, that somehow in this Xi concept that he had, um, the idea that these spaces that were once occupied is something that could trigger memories. It is a different sort of understanding of memory than that which we have in the West. But it's important to sort of understand really that Corbin was an old friend of Carl Jung, and they both used to speak once a year together um, at the Arenas conferences. And that this thinking 
from drawn way back from Shias has uh, had a great influence on on you and underlies his ideas that actually there is a transpersonal consciousness, a collective consciousness on which we can draw if only we know how to do it. And that these things that have gone, these things that are now absent, that have been suppressed or cancelled or, or removed from visibility, nonetheless, time and space, they still somehow exist and can, if you like, trigger memories in us and from those memories can flood back understandings and insights that otherwise had gone. Today, the massive polarization that is occurring today in the world, of course, is not simply geopolitical. It is not a competition over resources or even a, simply a rivalry based about trade relationships or about oil. The conflict between the Western elites and now the rest of humanity, essentially, Global South, is deeply ideological and deeply literal. We are in an extended period of revolution and civil war. It's an unusual revolution in one way, in that half of the population are not really aware that they're in a revolution, and the other half of our population are deeply conscious and are participants in the ongoing revolution. We are in a state of what I describe as betweenness. Some understand where we are and, and realize what it means. And for many others, they say, what are you talking about? Revolution, is there a revolution taking place? I mean, we don't see, everything seems to be, us to be really quite normal, quite unchanged. Yes, a few things, we're more flexible about certain things. We don't see this. Uh, as a revolution. And we have a ruling strata in Western society, in the United States and in Europe, who has a particular view of power. They view giving up power as the height of irresponsibility. They shouldn't give it up. They refuse to give it up. They see they're giving up, should they give up power, would be a huge betrayal, betrayal of all that they stand for, all the uh, values of the new order. And so they are not prepared to do that. So they are going to hold on to power. They're going to hold up to power, even if that trumps upholding the very order that brought them to power in the first place, or that of maintaining a constitution, or indeed of acting within the law. Indeed, we've seen recent polls that show that the majority of the ruling stratum believe that, uh, of course, the understanding of power is such that um, simply ignoring law is a duty. Is They are compelled to do this out of the sense of obligation. And what is this obligation that they're talking about? Is that they have the strong sense, deep sense in their societies, that holding on to power, that keeping power, um, is absent their elite guidance to the masses, absent their guidance, their instruction, their telling of the masses what they do. Our rulers believe that, that this, um, without their guidance, without their, our help, their help to us, um, they risk being stolen by populism, that they will be taken and held by populism, and that is not accepted. The disorder that results from the slide 
by the masses towards otherness, towards a different form of thinking, is what threatens, in their view, disorder and chaos and cannot be allowed. And this, of course, then makes them the ordinary people, the masses. It makes them not just, if you like, deviants from the order, it makes them the enemy of the new order that the ruling strata is trying to um, impose and trying to embed in our society. Um, it makes them the enemy of the new, what is called diversity, even if it is not quite diversity, which has now been, if I can use the word, sacralized to the point in which the very concept of diversity as defined in today's world is being considered somehow non-negotiable. So diversity, paradoxically, has been inverted, been turned upside down to legitimize uh, no wider horizons, no real diversity, but rather a new dogmatism. Rival minorities within this diversity, I mean identity minorities, are relegated to behind an array of beliefs that is completely impervious and opposed to discussion, to rational discussion. This physical segregation of the population to self-enclosed, heterogeneous, identity enclaves has its counterpart in the balkanization of opinion. Each compartment is barricaded behind its own dogmas. They emote at each other, but discussion becomes impossible. Therefore, all tools, all tools, money, institutions, media, must be put to the job of enforcing this new order with its new values. The ancient understanding of society and history, the world, was one of integrated totality. It offered a more holistic perspective, one which can account for rather than annul, cancel, or strike out contradictions within the fabric of reality. Contradictions and oppositions with his, within history and understanding today are regarded as dangerous rather than being understood as something as natural and common to the whole idea of history in an organic sense. The the reality is that an individual is that our individual life stories, stories of members of a community, in fact, over the course of time, uh, become enmeshed and intertwined. And this entanglement of personal stories, of our life, of our life experience, surges out to form the everyday weft and weave of what we know as communal life. This latter communal life can never be fun funneled, never contained into one single way of thinking, generated abstractly and imposed from central command. Defending historical holism however, implied ultimately the defense of unique experience in spite any superficial signs of contradiction or tension within, to defend the existence of your people, their unique culture and way of life as an organic whole, integral and holistic culmination of the people's historical existence in itself, 
is history viewed as a living, organic thing? The tool of free money that has overtaken Western society. Free money at zero interest rates for the last two decades has facilitated very clearly the enforcement of many things, but particularly the control of the media. The rush of free money at zero interest, called quantitative monetary easing or QE, was launched by Japan in 2001. The total credit created by central banks through QE is now more than 30 trillion in this modern era. QE, in fact, has become quietly the defining idea of our time. It drove inequality and it has polarized politics. For the past 15 years, every major development in the Western economy and the cultural superstructure that rests upon it, the explosive growth of social media, of big tech, the property boom, the gig economy, Elon Musk, cryptocurrencies, fake news, and capitalism, woke capitalism, all largely low owe their explosion to this flood of new zero interest free money. Trillions flooded into the financial system. It was magic to the financial world, but it also had another more toxic effect. The rush of free money gave big tech the power to buy up platforms that previously had relied on selling the news, of informing people, of investigating what was happening. They were to be replaced by entities beholden to advertisers that only cared about grabbing people's attention and then selling it on to the highest bidder. A new economy of attention arose, a machine for turning distraction and polarization and controversy into investor returns. It gave big tech the power to buy up platforms and relied on selling the news. They were replaced by entities beholden to advertisers that only cared about grabbing people's attention. This is a new economy of attention that arose, a machine for turning distraction and polarization into such financial returns. The power structures, the ruling strata, however, got it. Words no longer needed to have objective meanings in this market. Everything is about triggering attention, clickbaits, however achieved, true or false. That's what the advertisers wanted. Words could mean what those in power say they mean. The truth, the truth behind these narratives was irrelevant. What mattered was the force of narrative, now divorced from meaning, to compel singularity of messaging and to demand that belief in the new order can be reflected not just in compliance, but also in the assimilation of the messaging into one's personal conduct in life. Critical thinking, objections, denoted an enemy, a threat that had to be crushed. This revolution in civil war is likely to be extended over time. Enforcement of the new order will predominate initially, but ultimately the ruling strata will, I believe, overreach it. And this was really the point of my story from Corban, because 
What I'm saying is that memory, and time, and space are not as simple as we are led to believe. And that memories, if you like, like those, if you like, profiles, like those empty spaces um, from the past, uh, are things that do come to us, that come to us in certain moments and trigger remembrance of old ways of thinking, of ideas that may be now cancelled, ideas that may be now not tolerated. Um, but eventually, they do trigger thinking and ideas. And I think this is what is happening uh, today. And each time that society just says, no, the enforcement will become more stupidly heavy-handed. The elites ultimately will undercut themselves by resorting every time that someone says no to undercutting themselves. Julian Assange is a soldier seized and held by enemy, these enemy forces, an undeserving victim of the war. I mourn also Daria, a friend who was engulfed in a fireball as her car exploded, as a, in another battlefront to this war. I salute them both. Let us continue saying no, and also say, just go, just leave your fart. Thank you very much. Alistair, thank you very much for that overarching view of the forces at work uh, today. Uh, one of the ways in which it's happening here, and I'm sure um, elsewhere in the world, uh, one of the ways in which reality really is being cancelled is through the orchestration of complaints against journalists, against doctors and against politicians uh, who might alert us to the reality, to a reality. Um, it's it's a, a frightful, uh, there's a frightful amount of it going on in Australia and uh, I'm sure around the world. Thank you for um, your very eloquent, erudite um, summary really of where we have come and why and how we must uh, resist it if we do want to have a, a fair, a fairer world. Thank you very much for joining us today.